This slide shows the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and I guess they are familiar to most of you. They cover a wide range of aspects <clears throat> for a sustainable world, and the purpose here is to connect some of these goals to the automatic control subject, keeping in mind that this can give small, but anyway, contributions to the fulfillment of these goals. We have made the connection between the development goals and the control subject in a fairly simple and straightforward way. On several occasions during the courses, we have used some minutes of the lecture time to show a video or some photos of an example of an application of automatic control. We have then related the example to one of the development goals. And finally, we have motivated how automatic control plays a role in the application. In the paper here and the presentation, we will concentrate on two of the goals. Goal number three, which is about good health and well-being, and goal six, which is about clean water and sanitation. For goal three, we have picked two examples. The first one is about using uh, autonomous aerial vehicles for delivery of blood <clears throat> and medicine in areas with poor communication. And the second one is about ventilators, which are used when the patient's breathing does not work properly. In the aerial vehicle case, the outputs are course, speed and height. Inputs are thrust and rudder. In um, the ventilator case, the output is air pressure or the oxygen level in the blood of the patient. And the input is the airflow. For goal six, clean water and sanitation, we have used um, two examples. One is about wastewater treatment, and the second one is about water management in irrigation systems. And for the wastewater treatment case, the outputs are various measures of the water quality, and the inputs are, for example, airflow, but also other variables. For the water management case, the outputs are water level, flow, etc., in the compartments uh, of water, and the inputs are the gate openings between these compartments. So we have used these examples to illustrate control and connect them to sustainability. The courses we talk about were given during the first half of the fall semester 2020. And after they had finished, we asked the students to evaluate this idea. This was done by presenting uh, three statements and asking the students whether they agree or disagree. The first statement, corresponding to the blue bars, is that the control subject has natural connection to several of these development goals. The second statement, corresponding to the red bars, is that the connection has increased the motivation for the subject in the course. And the third statement, corresponding to the gray bars, is that the connection has given insight into possible jobs in the future. And as you can see in both diagrams, the blue bars show that the students mostly agree with the statement that there is a connection, a natural connection. For the second statement, uh, corresponding to the red bars, for the left diagram for that course, it's fairly equal, while for the right diagram on that course, it's more to the right, that means disagree. And for the third statement corresponding to the gray bars, for the left diagram, that course it's fairly equal. And for the right course, it's more shift to the right. Time does not allow to dig into the interpretation here. Partly, we, can, we think that uh, results are affected by the distance mode of the courses. There are some reflections given in the paper. For the discussion to come, we have a few questions. First, are there similar examples in other subjects where the discipline is presented as an enabling technology for sustainability? Second, should uh, the treatment of sustainability be in separate courses or integrated or maybe both? And third, is this important for all students or do all students care? And I'm sure there are more questions. Anyway, that's all from us. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you, Swanti, for the presentation. Okay, I would like now to open the floor for, uh, for discussion. So we have uh, several minutes to do this. So I see that there is uh, no questions in the chat box. So I guess uh, we'll just please just uh, unmute yourself and ask the questions. Uh, so I'm sure the team is more than happy to answer anything that you, you have. Anybody, let me just get, uh, please get started. Any questions? Maybe our audience are still a bit shy in the afternoon. <laughs> so maybe Sante, maybe I'll I'll be the first one to ask if you don't mind. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, uh, in your last slides, okay, uh, are these questions for a discussion here that we'd like to audience to contribute some answers, or this is something that you are exploring with your own team within your institution? No, those were questions for uh, this discussion. Uh, for example, uh, we will hear, I guess, uh, some examples of, of disciplines where people have connected the discipline to sustainability. So I mm -hmm. guess that one will be partly answered. Um, now I see, uh, uh, oh, sorry, was that an answer to your question? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I think you just answered the, the question. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. Um, yeah. I, I saw a question. Yeah. Okay, I think, um, well, we, I have seen some questions coming in now. So maybe that, that my question, we, we can wait. We can wait. Let's have an audience. Uh, I have an audience. Uh, give the preference to the audience. Yeah. So, okay, Daniel, uh, have, I have a question. Can you say something generally about students' interest in sustainable development? So, yes. Uh, <clears throat> my impression is that it differs. And it uh, depends on the program uh, you, the students are following. For one of the courses, the one I gave, one of the programs there is, is named um, Energy Environmental Management. So they have uh, sustainability and these issues uh, through their program. So, so they have a via the program and also when they enter, they have a, an interest in this. Mm -hmm. Then you, you for sure can find students that don't, don't care so much about it. So, so it varies. Say anything general about that. Mm -hmm. That's my impression from the programs I've met. Okay. All right. Um, it Daniel, that's the answer to your questions. I guess, um, well, if you have any further follow-up question, please go ahead and uh, let me just uh, look at the next question, all right, from uh, Namita, all right? What kind of examples were used to determine the goals? Mm. Okay, I, I just read the question <coughs> there. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> I mean, first of all, there has to be a quite, clear and uh, obvious use of uh, automatic control. And then uh, since we base these examples on showing uh, films or photos, there has to be some um, illustrations on the, uh, on the internet. Uh, that is, um, I mean, in a few minutes really illustrates the use of the subject. Mm -hmm. There are uh, examples. I've tried to find something really useful, but it's hard to, to really get a very clear. Uh, because, I mean, this student, this is a course about the general aspects of control. And we cannot expect them to be a specialist in chemical engineering or aeronautical engineering. They have to understand it quite quickly that, well, here, control is important. And it can be uh, of use, an enabling technology for, for uh, sustainability. So that is the basis for, for the choice of examples. Okay, thank you. Uh, time is really flying. So I guess we just have one more, on, enough time for one more question from the uh, uh, Tao Neng Fu. Right? He's asking any reason why 
high portion of students have given score three for your survey question. I guess that score three is neutral, yeah? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <clears throat> As I said in the, in the recorded presentation, the interpretation of these results uh, depend a little bit on the distance mode because it will be too complicated to explain here that mm. some of the students got this, these questions without having seen the examples. Oh. Uh, because mm. most, <clears throat> I mean, the lecture, the theoretical stuff in the course it was uh, were pre-recorded and the students were expected to watch these films mm -hmm. before and in the scheduled time <laughs> we showed these examples and then only half of the students attended yeah. because they had seen the theory before mm -hmm. and then they got questions about sustainability and some of them hadn't seen the films so it became a bit curious for them so, so <laughs> yeah that's Understand. one reason i think yeah. yeah. Sorry for, for not being able to give a better answer. <laughs> we are all learning from this experience, yeah? Yes. Guess, yeah, we are all learning from this experience, so we are all trying to, to see what's the... It guides our uh, action for the next step and what can we do in the next better, next round, yeah. 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 Okay, I think this... Uh, all right, so I think um, time, is almost, time is up, basically. All right, so we'll have to move on to the second presenter now, and he, he will be... Uh, Dr. Dr. Tao Neng Fu, Li Xiao Tong, and Lu Xingping. Okay, and you will share the topic on CDL approach for development of temperature rise measuring system. Dr. Tao, please. Good afternoon, Chairman, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad to present our conference paper, CDL approach for the development of temperature rise monitoring system. My name is Tao Neng Fu. The co-authors are Dr. Li Xiaodong and uh, Mr. Lu Jinping. In my presentation, I'll be covering first introduction, followed by urgent need of diabetic temperature rise, in short, ATR monitoring system for construction industry. CIO approach for the development of ATR monitoring system, future box and conclusions. We all know that CDIO is a framework of engineering education curricula for developing next generation engineers. CDIO provides educators with an important platform in engineering education to establish a new way of conceptualizing teaching and learning. CDIO approach for project-based learning has shown to increase the acquisition of both deeper technical knowledge and long technical skills. In our study, CDIO standards, especially sales CDIO standards 5, 6, 7, and 8, were used as guidelines for two groups of FRB students for the development of ATR system. The hydration reaction of cement during the course of mass concreting will release a large amount of heat. We, which will increase the concrete temperature dramatically. If the temperature difference between any two points inside the concrete is more than 27 degrees, the internal cracks will be developed. Furthermore, if the concrete temperature is higher than 70 degrees, a substance called hydrogen will be formed, which will cause surface cracks in the long run. Therefore, to understand the temperature development in mass concreting in advance, current practice of construction industry in Singapore is to do the mock-up tests for high-profile and commercial projects, which will result in problems such as time delay, higher cost, and disposal of materials. To overcome the above problems, it is necessary to develop a new system for accurate testing and monitoring the concrete temperature, especially the temperature rise in concrete in that environment, so that preventive measures can be planned in advance. Next, I will be elaborating how CDIO approach was applied for the development of ATR system, which included the aims of developing ATR monitoring system and 
CDIO approach for the development of ATR system. The aims of developing ATR systems are to replace current way of on-site mock-up test and monitor temperature rise in concrete. A trial mixture of concrete of interest is prepared in lab and its temperature rise is monitored when hydrated under adiabatic conditions in advance. Maximum allowable concrete temperature and the temperature differences are measured to ensure that proper planning occurs prior to concrete placement for real-world construction projects. In this study, two groups of FRP students were allocated and involved in the project. The first FRP group consisting of four students involved in conceiving the system specifications and designing the whole system. The intended learning outcomes are shown below. The second FRP group consisting of three students involved in facilitating the system fabrication at implementing stage and making concrete samples or testing to monitor temperature rise in concrete samples in order to check and validate systems reliability, repeatability, and durability at the operating stage. The intended learning outcome is shown below. Project briefings were conducted to students before the start of their FRP projects, which included aims and technical requirements of the system. For example, homogeneity of water temperature, the learning activities and tasks to be completed, safety requirements for using lab and lab equipment, etc. At the conceiving stage, students were required to come up with specifications for con concept design. To achieve this aim, students were required to do intensive reading of related materials as well as online research for a literature review to summarize and compare and contrast the functions of existing systems. Teamwork and collaborative learning was strongly encouraged. Peer review of teamwork was conducted as, at this stage. Peer issues the ATR system specifications. At design stage, students were required to design ATR system according to the specifications that they came up at the conceiving stage. To achieve this aim, FRP students were required to discuss with students and staff from other academic schools for acquiring cross-disciplinary knowledge on the design of ATR system. Teamwork and communication skills were developed through the activities. At implementing stage, fabrication of the system and development of computer software were done by an external fabricator and a software developer, respectively, according to the design, drawings, and flowcharts provided by the students. Students were required to play a coordination role to liaise with the external fabricator and the software developer for any queries. At operating stage, students were required to make many concrete samples for tests using the fabricated system to monitor adiabatic temperature rise in these concrete samples. Students were also required to collect the testing data and process the collected data in order to validate systems reliability, repeatability, and durability. The results show that for all mixers used, the difference in adiabatic temperature rise and the peak rate of temperature change were lower than 1.0 and 0.9 degrees, respectively. The survey of student learning experience was conducted after the completion of their FRPs. Two sets of survey questions shown in the table for the first and the second group of FRP students were designed and sent to them for feedback. Except question five, question one to question four requested students to choose a score from one to five for an indication of their satisfactory level. The survey results are plotted in the bar charts. From the bar charts, we can see that for group one FRP students, they felt that they had better improvement in communication skills. However, for group two FRP students, they felt that they had great improvement in building up their capability in collecting and analyzing data. For the future work, in short term, a capstone project which requires students to conceive and design a recipe for casting concrete samples and test them by the API system for monitoring its temperature rise 
will be developed for a module called Structural Inspection and Repair. In long term, more capstone projects using APR system for modules such as reinforced concrete design and construction materials can be developed for students to do their project based study under CDIO framework. For conclusions, we can draw as follows. This paper illustrates in detail how FIP students involved in R&D project using CDIO approach and successfully developed ATR systems for the construction industry to replace the current practice. The intended learning outcomes using CDIO approach were checked by survey questions. The positive survey results show that students have developed strong competency in obtaining disciplinary and cross-disciplinary knowledge, skills in reasoning through project-based learning, and a strong teamwork spirit in report writing and presentation. In the future, more capstone projects will be developed for students to do experiential learning of mass site concreting in laboratory environment under CIO framework. With that, I would like to conclude my presentation. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you for that presentation. So I think in the interest of time, I may just want to restrict the, the this and most to the two questions if they're from the participants. Okay, so that we uh, will continue with the rest of the presentation. So if there's any questions, uh, can you please uh, either type in the chat box or it will be faster if you just unmute yourself and ask Dr. Tao directly. Okay, so question time, anybody please? I think there's a question, two questions already there. Um, already? Yeah, yeah, already there. I think raised by someone. The first one is... Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, okay, I see uh, <clears throat> Bhante's question. So, uh, okay. Were the requirements specifically given or did the student develop them? Um, okay. Uh, the, the students were required to do first um, literature review right, through online research and compare and contrast existing similar systems, right, and to summarize all the problems which need to be solved, right. So then they come out with the specification. Of course, this specification, of, co of course, including some of the basic, basic functions, which the existing system already have, but there are some new specifications, new features, which haven't been addressed by the existing system. Right, so uh, these are the requirements for the students to do, uh, uh, to come out uh, for the first group of FRP students during the design stage. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, let's have this, uh, the la last question, which is the second question from uh, Dr. Chirawat. Okay, uh, I think he's from Chula, Uni uh, Chula University. So what is the stage of CDIO that the most difficult to apply in your subject? Why? And do you have any suggestion if you want to apply CDIO into our subject? Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. A few questions uh, there. <laughs> yes. Ask yes. Your best. Uh, it's a quite broad uh, question. Uh, it's actually a, a discussion session. Okay. So uh, to summarize, for this project, I think the most in, uh, difficult part is the implementation part, uh, because uh, the system need to be fabricated according to the design and make sure the quality everything are there, right? And followed by the, 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 the so-called the operation stage because the operation stage is also very important because the operation stage is to test, to verify, to justify that the system which has been fabricated according what we have designed initially. So uh, the most important is the fabrication implementation stage. Second one is the operating stage. And of course design, Sure, the thing can come out according to your, uh, to our, uh, you know, uh, uh, what we want. So, uh, conceive design, and of course, not that difficult from my point of view. Uh, yeah, but the implementing and the, uh, is the most difficult part. Followed by it takes long time. It, it, it took very long time to complete it, right? Because a lot of uh, in those sessions, because fabricator may not understand what we want. Right, because the fabrication is not done by us, by the external fabricator and the software development, another developer. So the, the communication are, you know, are very uh, important. Yes. 
And I think for other modules, uh, depends on the projects. Perhaps sometimes depends depends on the type of the projects. Uh, maybe the design stage is important. Uh, maybe, uh, I, but most of the time, I guess the implementing stage. Uh, you know, you have a lot of problems <laughs> to come across. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tao. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh, okay. Um, feel free to have us, uh, Dr. Tirawa, feel free to engage Dr. Tao in a separate uh, discussion. For, okay. The, the, the conference is, is, is still have two more days to go. All right. Uh, all right. So we will uh, move on to the next presenter. All right. Um, that will be from the optometry team. Okay. Led by Sumasri Kalakuri. Okay. And they will talk about workplace learning for the students, all right? So we will have the optometry team stand by, all right? And your presentation should be starting soon. Hello everyone, I'm Suma Shree from Singapore Polytechnic presenting on the topic Workplace Learning Model to Develop Self-Directed Learners in Optometry Education. Pratan and Dr. Yeo are the co-authors. Introducing the topic, Workplace Learning is an educational model that provides students with real-life work experiences where they can apply academic and technical skills and develop their employability. It deliberately merges theory with practice, knowledge with experience. Self-directed learning is the process in which an individual learner is motivated to take responsibility and accountability for their own learning, and it involves the following iterative stages, plan learning, manage learning, review and evaluate learning. Bit of background on the Diploma in Optometry program, the DOPT curriculum aims to produce optometry graduates who are equipped with technical skills and generic skills. The course aims to produce professionally co competent optometrists who are primary eye care practitioners and are self-directed and lifelong learners. Comparing the two approaches, the traditional approach imparts learning of the core modules in blocks and by direct instruction. The WBL teaching approach or the integrated clerkship model provides an integrated learning experience at the fully equipped learning space, the Singapore Polytechnic Optometry Center. The content of the four core optometry modules, self-directed learning skills and professional dispositions are integrated and delivered through active learning strategies like flip learning and various in-class activities like discussions, simulated practice, case studies and clinical training sessions. So the WBL model was first introduced in academic year 18-19-71 for year two students on an opt-in basis and the pilot cohort had one class of 20 students. The other two classes of the same year were considered the traditional cohort. The following academic year all three classes joined in as WBL cohort two. Of the four core optometry modules two were practical oriented and two were theory based. In order to evaluate the WBL model had developed STL skills, professional dispositions, and produced good academic performance in the optometry students, the following were investigated. The student survey consisted of six questions, was designed using a five-point Likert scale and administered to all students. It focused on STL, optometry skills, learning experience, and the professional dispositions. The focus group interview was done to gather more in-depth views of the WBL cohorts only. The questions were designed to understand the student's viewpoint on how the WBL model helped them develop SDL and the other professional dispositions. The adjunct lecturers served as independent third party observers on all students as they were involved only during the clinical training at SPOC. The questions were focused on interpersonal and critical thinking skills and traits of an independent optometrist. The final module score was a summative assessment score of written assessments, teamwork, class participation, presentation, communication, and practical skills. The findings were both the WBL and the traditional cohorts gave similar ratings for the student survey. Among the WBL cohort, greater than 60% reported that the WBL enabled them to be self-directed learners, and more than 80% felt that it helped develop useful optometry skills and knowledge. The FGI results were encouraging from both the WBL cohorts, especially the WBL cohort one, where they generally agreed that the WBL model helped them to develop the three main iterative stages of STL and also trained them to be self-directed learners. 
All the students from both the cohorts agreed that the approach helped them to better apply the skills and knowledge to examine and manage patients as the WBL provided early exposure to clinical training. The adjunct lecturers felt that the WBL cohort one fared better than when the cohort size increased in the WBL cohort two. The final module score also showed that the students performed differently in different modules. WBL seemed to work better for practical oriented modules. We have gained valuable insights from our experience with the two WBL cohorts. The feedback from the students and the adjunct lecturers provided us with the different perspectives for us to evaluate the model and also for continual improvement. Advantages being early exposure to real life patients, the experiential learning that the students obtained at the fully equipped learning space, and the integrated curriculum designed to develop good technical skills and professional dispositions, which were essential for a practicing optometrist. Students preferred a mix of formative and summative assessments. They felt that a continual assessment cumulative over the semester would gradually enhance their learning without the pressure of high stakes summative assessment. The students take on an active role since most activities of learning are student led and faculty guided. The role of the lecturer is that of a facilitator. Peer learning, students manage their learning mainly by discussing with their peers and the peer groups actually allow students to develop professional dispositions like communication, collaboration and teamwork. However, the WBL is a faculty intensive and resource intensive model. Since a small group of students follow a lecturer the entire semester in students faculty learning communities, it also requires sufficient time for the continuity of care. Hence, this model works better for smaller cohort sizes, particularly in practical components like clinical training. There are multiple benefits of WBL model, the most important of which is the development of STL skills. In conclusion, in optometry education, WBL model was able to develop self-directed learners, develop professional dispositions and generic employability skills, making our graduates work ready. To scale WBL, to adopt WBL for larger cohorts, faculty and resource availability must be considered. The learning points from the WBL model can be adopted for similar resource intensive engineering courses. These are the list of our references. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Have a good day. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Thank you, Suma, for the presentation. Okay, so, well, audience, it's time for question and answer. If, okay, if you have uh, any questions, please, you can type into the chat box. And I think the... All right, uh, Dr. Tirawat has already had one question coming in. All right, let me just read this out. How can you design the formative and summative assessment for this course? Why the students like formative assessment more than summative assessment? Yeah, look, this is the question. Yeah, thank you for that question. I think it's very obvious that uh, formative assessment being a way of their, it's a way that they can learn better because one of the things is there is no stress of grades. So it was basically by the teachers giving feedback and the students also learning from their pairs, peers as well. So the formative assessment helped them to enhance their learning without the stress of a grade or a marking. Uh, the summative assessment is basically because this is optometry is a professional course where they have to have an exit, uh, uh, exit test before they can actually go out to practice. So the summative assessment is actually one of the key elements that we also have to have to see that they can actually perform to a certain competency level. Yeah, so I hope I have answered your question. Okay, I will move on to read you the, the other question from Swante. Can you describe how the system works with adjunct lecturer? How the system with adjunct lecturer works? 
Yeah, again, okay, thank you for the question. So our course, again, uh, is a very clinical oriented course where the students are uh, uh, observing the lecturers and also examining patients at our optometry center. So when they go to the optometry center and when they're having the training, the clinical training, we have these adjunct lecturers who are only uh, uh, sort of uh, taking care of the students at the clinic alone. So they are not uh, related with the delivery of the modules and the delivery of the teaching methods as such, but they only see the students, the end product of the what the students can perform while examining patients. So that's why we consider them as third party independent observers. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, we still have time for another question or two. Anybody else would like to uh, ask more questions? on this uh, workplace learning for the optometry course. Anybody? Okay, I'm gonna count until from one to 10. No. <laughs> no? If not, then we're okay, we have, uh, we have slightly ahead of schedule. And in that case, we will just move on to the last presentation. And that is by me. <laughs> okay, so I will speak on sustainable development in chemical engineering curriculum. So review and moving ahead, right? So the video should be coming up soon. Hello. In this paper, I will share the review from the Diploma in Chemical Engineering and in Integrating Sustainable Development into its curriculum and plans for moving ahead. This presentation covers the following topics. As we are all aware, any challenge in educational reform is always constrained by available curriculum hours, but ever-increasing knowledge, skills and attitudes as economy progressed. The approach adopted by chemical engineering is to make double duty of teaching time so as to deliver dual impact learning to students, as will be explained in the next two slides. The basic curriculum necessarily covers the fundamental technical knowledge students will need when they enter the workforce, in this case, is the chemical processing industries. Overlay on the curriculum is a project spine that allows students to conceive, design, implement and operate an innovative chemical product or system that addresses sustainable development issues. The focus here is on the less privileged at the bottom of the pyramid. The learning is dual impact in that students can make use of the project management skills learned not only for product design and development in the workplace, but also for sustainable development. And in doing so, they are making use of the same principles of chemical engineering, coupled with various other CDIO skills. So, let's now take a look at what changes had taken place over the last 10 years since we introduced sustainable development into our curriculum. We will specifically address the changes in the educational approach and the impact of Industry 4.0. What we found was that the old way of teaching sustainability to students is not working, and new approaches are required. A new approach is to look at sustainability using a systems perspective, recognizing its dynamic nature that is constantly changing. The two roles of education towards sustainable development are as shown on this slide, which in a nutshell, is to prepare students for more active involvement in tackling sustainability issues. More specifically, this calls for a change in the way students were engaged. The widely accepted approach is that of transformational learning, as articulated by Jack Mazzaro. Essentially, it is about empowering students to move forward and take actions to address sustainability issues. This is achieved by equipping them with the competency to discern, for themselves, the competing viewpoints on sustainability, rather than telling them what ought to be done. The goal is to develop sustainability mindset among students by simultaneously engaging all three elements of knowing, doing, and being. For transformational learning to take place, more attention need to be placed on the effective domain of learning. This requires a change in role of educators and teaching practice. Next, 
a quick take on the impact of Industra 4.0. The literature indicated that there had been controversies and debates on the relative merits of industrial Internet of Things and sustainable development. Concerns had been raised of possible unintended consequences. When Industry 4.0 technologies are adopted in the name of improving sustainability, it may be ill-suited to the very same community that one is trying to help. A survey of our past work showed that we had been successful in instilling can-do spirit among our students. But more needs to be done if we aspire to attain the desired transformation outcomes explained earlier. We need to embark on redesigning our curriculum, again using CDIO, but this time to focus more on the effective domain. We can start by aligning the UN SDG with the four main focus areas in chemical engineering. The redesigned curriculum will take into account explicit references to UN SDG and the competencies required to make use of Industry 4.0 technologies for the benefit of both workplace requirements and sustainable development. In short, the dual impact learning approach is retained but updated to include skills needed for Industry 4.0 and for transformative learning. Our plan is to teach sustainability as a discourse, with the intended outcomes as shown. One way to do this, is to tap into existing debate on using food crops for production of fuels, which is one of the well-known wicked problems. Two skills that can be useful for both Industry 4.0 and sustainable development are, sense making and digital fluency. It can be developed via our two existing learning pathways to achieve our desired dual outcomes of education. Here are some examples of how sense making and digital literacy skills can be progressively developed over the duration of the program, using the CDIO way of curriculum integration. We will not go into the details here. Suffice to note that convergence will occur at later stage of study where both skills will need to be used simultaneously, along with other skills such as teamwork, critical thinking, etc. Moving on, we will briefly look at the challenges ahead. As few, if any, lecturers are trained in this due to the interdisciplinary knowledge needed. One of the main challenges is how to equip lecturers with the skills to better facilitate student discussions around sustainability issues. We may take reference from this publication on UNESCO's Pillars of Education, how to enhance lecturers' competence in teaching sustainability. The other main challenge is on assessment. One way to do this is the DAB framework shown here, which uses online survey questionnaire. We will explore the suitability of this approach as we plan to move ahead as part of continual improvement. That is all the time that we have for this sharing. Thank you for listening. Moving on next, it's time for questions and answers. So that, that is my presentation. I, I'm sorry I didn't, you didn't get to hear my own voice because I tried it and it doesn't work very well. I have to do a retake and retake umpteen times so I gave up. So, okay, so question time now, all right? So the, I'm the last speaker for this session. So feel free to ask me any questions regarding my presentation just now. You can use the unmute yourself and ask, or you may just want to type into the chat box as usual. Okay, I have one question. All right. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Can okay. you speak louder? Uh, yeah, just okay. slightly a bit louder will do. Uh, I would like you to share about your experience about uh, evaluate the uh, feeling or motivation, something like that. Because uh, my my problem is uh, is it's quite difficult to evaluate the feeling or the how to say the motivation of the students something like that. Okay. You have. Yeah. Okay. So that, that is the work that we have done earlier in the last 10 years. All right. So 
So what we have is that the, we have a project spine in our curriculum, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. we have three, uh, in this current form, we have actually, um, okay, we have a capstone project in their final year, right? But yeah. before that, they have two semesters of product design study in year two. So one in semester one and another one in semester two. Right? So we make sure that we, uh, we, ex we started with uh, teaching the students to empathize with the problems, the challenge, to understand the challenges faced by the problem in terms of, for example, food, food challenges or clean water. So we have, we have uh, equipped the students with an empathy study to un at least understand the challenges. All right. So that, that is the, the first part. And we make sure that when, when, they, uh, when they are doing these projects, because it's geared towards the less privileged at the bottom of the pyramid, Okay, so they don't need to use very high high technology. Right? In fact, we make do with a, a lot of uh, readily available material. So in, in that sense, the, the students have a feel that they, they can contribute something. Initially, you are right. They are not so confident right? because they say that I'm only a student. What can I do? But, but with our slowly, when we guide them through the approach so that the... Um, they realize that they can actually make use of the topics that they have learned, the principle they have learned, like heat transfer of uh, fluid transfer to design something that will work for the villagers, you know? Yeah, so, so in that way, we, we find that that works pretty well. So right now, we are just looking at it that, that is, uh, um, there has been a lot of changes in the last 10 years since we tried this sustainable development. So how to, uh, how to make, move forward in this area yeah i hope i answer your question okay all right. thank you thank you all right uh any any more questions that is coming up from anybody we still have some time in fact we have a good 10 minutes yes sir, i have a question yes okay uh, please ask you you mentioned that uh, the students meet these uh, wicked problems yes yes do they need uh, more coaching to handle this uh, confusion that these oh, yes. pro problems um, cause? Yes, definitely. You are very good question, and definitely. So we have introduced our students to the the. We have a first in the first year semester first semester we have we have an introduction to chemical engineering module for the students whereby we introduce them to the discipline and the role and responsibilities of chemical engineers to the, uh, to the industry, to the society, to the environment. Okay, so one of the things that we, we introduce them to is, uh, some, is the problem of bio uh, food, food problem and the dilemma of producing food you know, for the less privileged or to feed the hunger. Right, or to, to convert it to biofuel so that uh, you know, the rich can, uh, can drive more comfortably and less, with less guilt. You know? so, so we built on that to, to, to let them have an idea of the complexity of the problem. So, and, and later on, we will, we will revisit some of these issues again and we show them how technology can, uh, can, imp uh, can help to improve the yield of biofuel from the production. So there's a technology part, so they know what they can do about it. And, and uh, along the way, we let them expose them. And we also have a, um, a, a module is that is a, we call it a stakeholder module is applies for all students within the Singapore Polytechnic and they've learned about design thinking. And that they, they also, the, the empathy, they especially learn more about empathy there as well. So we built on that so that let them to study the, 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 the poverty problems or clean water problems right? and look at it from the one of the quest, one of the topic that they have learned to see is look at issues from different perspective. So it doesn't mean that it's always uh, what is good for me means it, it is desirable for you. Yeah, so we have to have, so we, we use the, the integrated curriculum in CDAO to to cover, to give that exposure in other subject matters as well. But uh, by and large, that, that their, their product design module is the one that carries them to the capstone. But it, it is 
covered elsewhere in the different parts of the the other subjects as well. So we are, it's to reinforce the point that we are we are making. Yeah. Well, I hope that answers your 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 question. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Uh, anybody else have uh, we still have some time? Hello, uh, Simon Eileen yeah. here. Yes. Hi. I uh, just yes, wonder, I... do you have a big teaching team for this module? Um, if so, how do you manage the teaching team in terms of them having the same mindset as to how this module could be delivered? Thank you. Okay, uh, that's a good question. Okay, well, we have we don't really have a big team, but we have a dedicated team who is uh, teaching product design and development. Uh, so they they are involved in the in the year two teaching, and they are also act as the supervisors for the final year project. Yeah, so so that is the, the short version of the answer. So we have a, a, a with, uh, about a team of probably about five people. So so not every lecturer serve as a project supervisor in the end. So only only a selected number. So we sort of divided the the work. Not everybody becomes project supervisors at the end. We just this okay. few will focus on handling student projects. Right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. <laughs> Anybody have any suggestions? If there are no questions, perhaps I, I will ask you for some suggestions. So what I, can I do to move forward? I mean, this is the, this is the, the I just shared the plan, right? We're studying what we have done for the last 10 years. Obviously, a lot of things have changed in the last 10 years, right? And so we want to really move forward to, to empower the students more uh, to, 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 to at least take action or to give sustainable development, more thoughts than just merely completing a project and, you know, and graduate from here, basically. Yeah. Or you, you can wish me luck. <laughs> not sure how to do it, <laughs> honestly. I, I, I think uh, I just repeat what I said to Swente earlier. We are all, I'm, I'm learning from this experience to see how, we, how I can move forward. Right? It took me 10 years to do this already. So the next 10 years is even bigger unknown, I would think. Than, than before, yeah. Any 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 thoughts on that or any other questions? Uh, may not be fair for me to ask you to to, to help me with this, but uh, maybe other questions they may have. Oh, can can I ask one yes, more yes. question? Yes, please. We have time uh, for people. from your slide that you said about sense making and dual uh, digital fluency, right? As the Dual outcome education. Can you uh, share about the teaching and learning activity for, for this outcome? Okay. So currently we are planning the activities for this. Or so, uh, you're asking about digital fluency, right? Yes. Yes. So, they are so, yeah, yeah. So they are currently outcome, we are right? yes, we are planning the 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 learning activity for what is first of all, of course, we look at what does digital fluency means, right? So, and then we and we investigate further and look at it, what is the building blocks or the underpinning knowledge required for digital fluency. So it started with is so what we have decided to to move ahead is we started with getting the students to understand what are good data, good information, and bad information especially in today's world and we have a lot of you know uh, fake news and whatnot so how do how do they decide that if a, a set of data information that they find are good information and in terms of experimentation when they carry out experimentation they have to understand the concept of reliability and validity of data and and when they move on all right they need to learn how to how to analyze big quantity of data and how to represent data in a, to have more clarity. So in other words, how to better improve on their data presentation skills. Okay, so our students may, may be able to use Excel, but sometimes you know, they, they may not know the best way to present, the, the, to categorize or to group the data and, um, and manipulate the data. So these are all uh, different stages that of uh, different complexity of data fluency that we want to build them up from the first year 
until when they reach their final year, when they can, when they are doing their capstone projects, they can better manage their experimental data. So, so that is uh, that is that is the plan for uh, that we we aim to do. We are going to start this one in the yeah in the next semester. Thank you very much. Okay, you're most welcome. All right, I guess the, that's about the time that we have. All right, uh, so, okay, I would like to uh, close the session now. Thank you very much for the participation and um, the speakers for your presentation. Okay, I wish you have a good day.